Hi everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoy our shows, please like our videos and subscribe to our channel. And remember to hit the bell for notifications. And you can support us via PayPal, Patreon, Bitcoin, and through our website, ageoftruth.tv. The kind of control that the government now has on our lives, nobody could have envisioned 100 or 200 years ago. They really control your whole life. And now in the Western world, we know that our life is controlled. They control the conception, they control the preconception, they control the birth, they control you know, the vaccines, they control your health. They, there's no sphere of life that is not under control. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. Our guest today is a formidable American-born lady with a clear mission. Truth, freedom and independence. She studied anthroposophy, the work and philosophy of Rudolf Steiner, at the Mercy College in Detroit and in England and Switzerland. She's an advanced biomechanical rehabilitation therapist, trainer and researcher who is the initiator and representative for the In Power Movement division in Denmark. Common law, natural law versus civil law. Diane Vincent. Diane Vincent, we are thrilled to have you on the show and welcome to Copenhagen. Thank you very much. You actually live in Denmark, but very far from the capital and we are here in Copenhagen now and you've lived here for a long time. You are originally from Chicago in, in the States, but you also lived all over the world. And we will go into a little bit, you know, your background and your history, what led you on the path of truth research and becoming this rebel. We have a lot of things to discuss today. <laughs> the notice of liability, the in-power movement, independence from the state, what is civil law versus common law, natural law, even Roman law. And we also want to talk about your work and you've been studying Rudolf Steiner's teachings, anthroposophy for a long time as well. We are in the middle of this world crisis due to the coronavirus COVID-19 situation that we have been facing. We have to wear masks. But you came here to Copenhagen without a mask. You're not wearing a mask. Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you being an obedient citizen? Why aren't you just following the rules, Diane? Why don't you wear a mask? Well, I don't want to appear as if I'm really such a big rebel, but um, what is this mask? You have to ask yourself, there's many things, you know, it's a, it's a symbol. And those who want to change things need to change our behavior and get our acceptance. So one very visible way of getting everyone's acceptance is of things that are down the pipeline, one could say, or as one uses this expression, ones that things that are in the planning is to make sure that people started to change their behavior. So we had a lot of things we should start to change. We can't shake hands, we can't give hugs. I was even at my dentist one day and I'm just lying there looking at the ceiling and she had the radio on and I heard that, well, it's loosening up here in Denmark and the 
uh, health minister has said we can now have sex and kiss our partners again. I'm thinking, wow, okay. So they're really working hard on changing behavior, where you go, who you're with, all these things. So the mask is a very visible sign of now we've got your acceptance. And, a new and book, compliance <coughs> as well. Compliance and acceptance. Even um, now I forgot to research the book, but there is a new book that came out in Danish um, called No Embeds Men Lay Low, when the embeds people make the laws. Um, it was a book that uh, the, uh, the Danish government asked to be written, so they asked four law professors, I think they were in Aarhus, to write a book about how do we make laws in Denmark. The big book begins with, law is based on acceptance. A law cannot be a law if people do not accept it. It starts in the introduction. They say very interesting things. So one can sort of, and then of course the book goes further to, to describe how the laws in Denmark are made and how the laws in Denmark aren't made after the way our constitution says that laws should be made anymore. It stopped quite a few years ago. So he, they describe all this and they're in kind of a state of puzzlement, but then they say, well, as long as the people accept the laws, then they should be fine. So why am I not wearing a mask? I don't think it's, pro I, I haven't really researched it. Is it a law? Did the queen say they had to make the law? Did enough ministers sign the law to become a law? Did it go through the procedures that are needed to be a law in Denmark? Probably not. And so it's probably not a law, it's something they said we should do. So they want us to change our behavior. And they're certainly using the, the mainstream media to heavily, heavily promote this. And th this is, of course, fear propaganda. And people are following this all the time, listening to this and actually also policing each other out there, which is also uh, a plan, uh, mm -hmm. strategy, isn't it? And this is also a sign of do, do not speak. Do not um, speak the truth and freedom of speech. And we are all being heavily censored, those of us who are speaking the truth on the internet or at least presenting an alternative view of what is going on in the world. Well, my impression has been that there's a big plan going on. This plan they've been speaking about, everything's open. I mean, if we find, follow back, how many presidents do we have to go back until we f see that they were in America already talking about this so-called new world order. So if anyone asks the question when Bush Sr. was talking about the new world order and maybe even previous people, I don't remember, what is this new world order they're talking about? And, you know, Clinton did it, Obama did it. Um, well. It, to get there, you have to create some kind of crisis so that everyone accepts it and realizes we need to do it. So I think they're changing out the government. I think they're changing the political scene in such a way that another government can come in and everyone will accept it because it's a crisis. And we know in America already previous presidents like Obama, they created all these new executive orders where they actually FEMA, uh, the federal blah, blah, blah management, so which was created under Bush in the terror times after 9-11, they created the FEMA organizations. FEMA camps. Camps and the camps and everything. So that's well created organization and structure. And there are people so that run it. So it's all there. It's in the background. Well, it's in case we need it. Um, if in case of a crisis, uh, if the president creates a state of emergency, then FEMA takes over. So actually, President Trump did create a state of emergency in March. And following the laws, the executive orders, that means FEMA is now running the government. Quite, it's, it's there. It's in, you can read all these things. So when the president creates a state of emergency, then FEMA takes over. So FEMA has the, per executive orders, FEMA has the power over all the transit, all the food, all the places to live. They can move entire populations after any kind of decision they take because it's an emergency management program. And this is also a UN Agenda 21, UN Agenda 2030, ultimately UN Agenda 2050 
plan, agenda that they've spoken about for a long time as well, right? Yes, of course, they've been speaking about these things. I mean, I'm not so deeply, I haven't studied it so deeply as some of the other people who have been here with you before, like Deborah Traves. She's really studied this. We've done a couple of shows with Rosa Corey, with Rosa who's Corey, very I into, watched as well. mm. to uh, UN Agenda 21, mm. and, and Deborah Tavares, yes. Yes, and uh, y then you, you see how they work or in the open. We can see it, but if we don't connect things by using our thoughts, People don't understand what it is. They think it's great, you know, and they put it on their websites. We're part of uh, UN 17 World Goals or whatever they're calling it. So they think it's good. They think it's nice. They, they use words like sustainability. So they hijacked a lot of words. They hijack words all the time. They have nothing to do with it, but they hijack the words and put them there. And everyone thinks it's good because they don't try to connect the dots. So if you want, they know they have to create a crisis to be able to initiate something. That's how it works. Create crisis and then come to a higher level of structure or political m power that they wish to have. So COVID is a nice way to do it. We didn't know how they would do it. I didn't know it was going to be a health crisis. I mean, one could see the things they're creating. They're creating the structure for a world government. They've been working on it since World War I, pre-World War I, actually. You can follow it into the end of the previous century, not the uh, 1800s, already there, they were speaking about things. Um, and they have spoken about wanting to implement a new world order since... Before World War One. they were already planning what they want to get out of World War One and Two, And exactly. they got that. So if one starts to see these things over the years, then you, you kind of get a feel for, okay... Um, With the creation of the Federal Reserve, huh? For example, that, yeah that they create a Federal Reserve Bank and take away the, the ability of the states, each independent government to create money. But still, all this thing with the money, that's very hidden, you know. It, do the governments actually create money or do they borrow money from banks? I was talking to my colleague yesterday and he was telling me he knows uh, somebody very high in the bank system in Cyprus where he lives. Well, she told him the European Central Bank is calling them all the time and telling them they can have money for minus interest and pushing the money on the bank. So the European Central Bank is creating money, pushing it into the banks of the countries in Europe, and then these banks can do what they want with it. So if you go and say to the bank, your own bank, you know, hey, I heard you're getting money for minus interest rates. Would you give me a good loan because I can't keep my company going in this crisis time? Do you think they would give it to you? No. But what, are, what can they otherwise do with it? They can keep the stock market up. They can keep investing. They can invest in all sorts of things that might be crumbling because people are searching where to put their money now and make sure it's okay and it's going to survive or their assets are going to survive through the crisis. So he knows exactly that they're not lending it out to small business, personal loans to keep, be able to keep your house at a cheaper rate, although they're getting money to minus interest rates from the European Central Banks. So the whole bank and in, uh, the countries and their independence, those, those are very tightly connected. A country is not independent if it doesn't control the money supply. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's yeah. very simple. So the whole situation with the masks, how long do you think this is going to take before <laughs> we can take off these masks again? I mean, for those people who actually wear them. Mm. I have no idea. I, I really can't say what's going to come. One can s see there's plans. They, keep, they were talking about the masks already from the very beginning. And um, th I think that this kind of... You know, oh, in Sweden it's like this, and one Spain it's like this. This is like, it's an entertainment for us. Oh, they have to wear masks in Germany. And then people go to Germany and they, they write, oh, it's not so bad as we thought. So, so it's all a kind of entertainment. But masks. it's not very entertaining when people <laughs> have to be forced to do something here Freedom. and also eventually uh, taking the, 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 the vaccines that they have planned. And we want to get into that as well. But before we go on with all of the things we want to discuss today, we still need to hear a little bit about your background and your history. What led you on this fascinating path? 
I was born in Chicago, as you said. I lived in the middle for five years. Then we started, mo we moved to a suburb, and then we moved to another suburb. <clears throat> in the second suburb we moved to, it's called Evanston, Illinois. It was at that time a much different suburb from most of the other ones around Chicago. It was very mixed, culturally mixed, socioeconomically mixed. There were blacks, there were whites, there were rich, there were poor. In my first suburb, I never met anyone Jewish or anything like that. It was very a bedroom suburb, very white, middle class, everyone had their houses and so on. And my, my parents were sort of civil rights, a little bit active, and they were trying to get a black person to move in. So they were fighting with the realtors because the realtors were guiding all the black people who might have wanted to move into our town to other towns. So there was this interest in, that I grew up with. Yeah? And also what happened, well, you know, my, my first memories are, John F. Kennedy got killed, and then Robert F. Kennedy got killed, and then Martin Luther King got killed, and then four young people got killed in Kent State. Those were huge things for, for my um, growing up, as well as the Vietnam War. And, um, traumatic, really. Traumatic, yeah. And in, in the 60, what was it, 68, there were the Democratic Convention was in Chicago, where the riots were going on. And there just hearing all the time that, oh, protocols were changed suddenly. The Chicago police had always been very good at dealing with riots, and suddenly they were using billy clubs for not even riots, just demonstrations with young people with long hair. And I was eight years old, so I was too young to be a hippie, and I was like, oh, when I grew up, I was going to be a hippie. But I was too young, you know, I missed that movement. So, so you grew up in America. How long were you there for, and what made you decide to, to move to Europe, where you've li lived most of your life, huh? Yeah, actually mu much more than I lived in the States. I, I had a very strange experience, or a very interesting experience, or many, at, in my high school, you know, because I was working on university farms. So in the university of farms, there's experiments going on. Experiments. It's about experimenting how to get more out of a cow, for example. So did they experiment on the animals, or was it like like GMO, what we've heard from Monsanto? Well, it was Monsanto. before G GMO, it was pre-GMO. So in the universities in America, they have huge amounts of money coming in from funds, from the Rockefeller Foundation, from the Ford Foundation, from people who have economic interests in the research. So the only money they get is from the funds. So these are the rich families who have collected money over the years by not paying taxes, putting their tax, instead of paying taxes, they put in the funds, and then they're able to make sure that the research they want gets done. So one of the, uh, was Madison University, it's a 30,000 student university, this typical in America that university. That is a lot of students. It's a of lot students. of students, it's like, it's just a packing machine, you know. Anyway, they had lots of money for research and farming. Um, and I was in one barn and there were, you know, four types of cows, here one, here one, here one, here one. And then they had cows with holes in their stomach. And this, this ability to put a hole in a cow's stomach, it was on the right side actually, that's been known, that was already then known for 30 years. Um, they'd been doing it, so you can... How, why did they do that? Well, ask yourself the question, you know. I already learned when I was in my biology in the freshman year that we have a digestive system that is anaerobic without air oxygen does not get into our digestive system but there you put a hole there and you think you can study the cow better and you his digestive process by being able to take things out yeah so then there were these other cows they had with three holes they had the big hole on the right side and you know cows have three or four stomachs or something and then they had made two tubes on the other side and then there were all these graduate students coming in at around the clock, you know, 10, 12, 2, 4. They were coming around the clock, taking samples out from this very smelly stuff. You know, it really stinks to get this stuff out of a cow's stomach. But this stuff stinks. And they're taking all these little experiments, writing stuff down, measuring. But it sounds analyzing. like torture well, for the cows. Well, of course it's a torture. But then it goes further. So one day you come in, oh, there's a dead cow. Well, oh, okay, the cow died. The cows with the three stomachs, they die very regularly. So then one day the vet came in and he was doing an autopsy of the cow. So I'm just, you know, I'm 19. I'm, well, what happened to him? <laughs> 
Well, it's very interesting, he tells me. When I autopsy these cows and look for their organs, I can't find them. They disintegrate. They dissolve. So they die of organ disintegration. Really? Yeah, that's what the vet told me. So I'm thinking, okay, today in the study, tomorrow disintegrated organ. We put a new cow there. We put some more holes in it. The study goes on. Because they did these holes in the cows. I think so. Why would they otherwise? He just said he's the vet. You know, he autopsies all their cows that die. He comes in every day when a cow dies and they die regularly. So I thought, wow, this is interesting research they're doing here on these cows that are tortured, you know. So in front of these cows with the three holes, they would put the food every day. One day they were eating newspapers. <laughs> the another day they were eating cardboard. Oh, it's interesting. Do cows like cardboard? Well, one day I saw them, they, would, they had a little room where they all went in and they brought the cow out then. I said, what were you doing in there? Oh, well, when we change the food from newspapers to cardboard, it takes a few days for the cows to get used to eating that. Strange that it takes so long, I think. Anyway, so we found out if we open that one hole and take out the cardboard and put the newspaper in, close it again, then the cow will eat the newspaper faster. This is fascinating research. Oh, who's paying for this study? Anyway, one day they sent me through some barns, you know, boop, through the dark barns, and I had to do something over there. So I didn't even know there were more of these barns. So I went in the door. I really thought I was going into the cow twilight zone. There were these cows that could hardly walk. They could really hardly walk, and there were some of them sort of coming, and they had to go up a little ramp, and their feet kept sliding down this uh, concrete. And then I go a little bit further, look on the ground. There's cow teeth lying around. Cow teeth? I never saw cow teeth before. I worked on a lot of farms. I never saw a cow tooth lying around. Do they lose their teeth? So then I'm like, what are you doing in here? Oh, it's a fluoride experiment. Fluoride? Yeah, you know fluoride they put in the water. Yeah, we all have fluoride in our water. My mom tells me it's good because... And in the toothpaste. Yeah, and the toothpaste, you know. Oh yeah, well, there was this company out west and they were burning something which let fluoride come down onto the fields. So the farmers took them to court because it was killing their cows. So they decided we're going to do a research project. It's already 20 years. These cows, oh, they look very sick, don't they? Yeah, we can't let them out in winter because when they fall, they don't just break a leg and they fall a lot if it's icy. Their bones shatter. What's that mean? Just like glass, throw the glass on the floor. Their bones shatter. I'm like, oh, this is cool experiment. Is, the, is there a PhD work? Oh no, they suppress the, the results. This is research. <laughs> what happened? What changed your, your perception of what was actually going on? That this was animal mutilation, that this was torture? It was very interesting for me, but at the same time, they do horrible things to the cows all day long. The, the vet comes and castrates calves, just cut them off and do things to the tails, put rubber bands on the sheep's tails until they fall off and, you know, so kill kittens. That, that's what farmers do. They do all these things. And, and um, I never thought it was right. It seemed horrific to me. And those were in the good days. Now that things have really gone bad, <laughs> in those days it was still like a nice barn where the cows had some space. Let's not go into how they treat animals in China. You can't go to these farms. They won't let you in. Right. So please take us uh, to where you moved to Europe and what led you on this path that you're on now. There was a year training that they had in Mercy College in anthroposophy, so you could get university credits for that. Anthroposophy, yeah. which is a fascinating uh, name there. Mm -hmm. That is the, the philosophy and the work, the, the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, and his students. So, And I mean, this is the thing about Rudolf Steiner that he gave a lot of teachings, but he was always answering questions, you know. He didn't say, make schools. He didn't say, make farms. People were dragging him. The one who started the, the who got the course going for the biodynamic farming, she was writing to him for, for years, I think, trying to get him to come to Kobowitz in, now I guess it's Poland, in the eastern part of Germany, 
Poland to get him to come up there. Her name was Kaiserling, Grafin. She was a Graf, whatever that is in English. And Rudolf Steiner was Austrian, huh? He's from the old Austrian Hungary, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the border, I think, to what was became Yugoslavia, but I'm, it was in that area, yes. But he's Austrian Hungary, mm -hmm. yeah. And he was born in, I think, 1860-something, actually, Twenty, yes. and, and died in 1925 or around that time. No, no, I'm Could not exactly sure. 23, 24, yeah, mm -hmm. but not later than that. In a very famous quote, well, he made many famous quotes, of course, R Rudolf Steiner, but, but there is one here where he says, to be free is to be capable of thinking one's own thoughts, not the thoughts merely of the body or of society, but thoughts generated by one's deepest, most original, most essential and spiritual self, one's individuality. Cool. <laughs> And that is a very, very interesting quote. And he made many of those. Hmm. That could very well be a quote we could use today, right? That is what we're seeing, what is actually very true of 2020. Mm -hmm. What made you interested in anthroposophy and R Rudolf Steiner's teachings? Well, for me, it seemed like it made the most sense. It just made, it was like, for me, it was common sense. But he had a very different way of working and thinking and he created this unusual different school system for, for children, a new way, a different way of learning things, huh? Mm. Very okay. different from how the public school works. Mm. And that for me made complete sense. When I heard, started hearing about, this, hearing about the schools, I felt so sad that I hadn't been on such a school. I really felt very sad. Oh, what wonderful. And I thought, this is amazing. It just... And did they have those schools in America? There were some, but not many. Now there's much, many more, but at that time there were some schools. Mm -hmm. Chicago didn't have a school and my parents would never, I don't think they would have. So you studied that for at least seven years in Detroit, huh? No, no. I was in, in, in Detroit one year. One year. So, so one year they had at that time and in Detroit, and there were so other places in the world, they, had, they called it a foundation year, where you just sort of get to know, they had a lot of teachers coming in, they had teachers, I mean, our main teachers were from Austria, both of them were Jews, or from Jewish families that had been sent out and rescued from the Nazi times to the West, um, and they, they, they were the main teachers at the school, and they were in their 60s then, I think, and they brought us, they created the curriculum. There was also a farmer who's just been uh, in, a f in a film that's called The, L the Biggest Little Farm. Oh, he, his name was Alan York. He was a gardener, so he had this amazing biodynamic garden there that we could work in, um, or part of the curriculum. So I had gardening in the morning, one hour of that, and then the teachings or the, the lectures and so on started. And then there was a lot of handwork, so we did a lot of artistic things as well. And then in that year, I decided, okay, it's not going to be farming. I'm going to go to England and study this year with me. So that's an art of movement. So you wanted to be, or wanted to become a Rudolf Steiner teacher. Was that First it? First of all, I want to study this year with me, which is, it's, it's an art of movement based also on completely different principles than other thing, other movement techniques. So it's based really on sound and speech and you, in a phenomenological way, you try to dive into sounds and convert sound to movement. Did you ever think about what do I do when I speak? Well, I was taught to do that, but a lot of people probably don't even think about that. No, huh? but it's inc incredibly um, complex. First of all, the physiological aspects of, of it are so complex mm -hmm. that we Well, use... depending on what language we speak, huh? Also. Also, yeah, but we're using our respiration system, we're using the the flow, we're, we're controlling the flow with our larynx, we're shaping it with our mouth and our teeth and our tongue and then these sounds come out. But so the sounds are more elemental than the meaning. We're always catching the meaning with our thoughts, but behind the thoughts are this intricate way of Im immersing ourselves in movement qualities which the, we then articulate in speech. So the eurythmia is 
about, in the first instance, going back to the sounds, going to the sounds, and these sounds have a movement behind them. Mm. Finding those sounds and learning how to move. And did you work with those sounds? I did you? studied in England four years, and then I did two further years in Switzerland, and mm. then we had an artistic group which traveled around quite a bit for a few years. So we went to East Germany and lived there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, you are an American, mm -hmm. but you, you've kind of lost that, <laughs> that American way of that twang, that, that, that way that you were probably brought up speaking. Was that because you moved to Europe or you're very adaptable to, and you lived so many places in Germany, Switzerland and England, and now in Denmark for a long time? I'm sure it's very mixed up, you know, I don't even know how I could untangle this accent anymore. <laughs> I used to, my mother would send me to my grandma's, you know, in this little Eureka town. And then I came back with that accent and she was always looking at me with big eyes like, don't speak like that, you know. <laughs> but I really liked going there and speaking like that. So I think I did it already when I was So child. how many languages do you speak now? Well, I speak English, obviously. I speak German because I lived in Switzerland and Germany so long. But Danish, oh my goodness. I speak Danish, but you know how hard it is to understand me. <laughs> my son told me. Not today. really. I think you're pretty good at it, actually. <laughs> my son said, don't speak Danish when you teach anymore, mom. So you became an advanced biomechanical rehabilitation therapist. What, just briefly, what is that? You've been working with that for a long time. We have many varieties. Um, we have anything from genetic illnesses, cerebral palsy, late cerebral palsy, or what they call infantile cerebral palsy, which you could be born with, which is more or less the nobody knows diagnosis, how they got it. Um, many are premature children. Many have, they could be this vac uh, autism spectrum. So it's really a variety of children. What, some could have had a late accident later in life. Um, many, but most of them are born with the condition. But now we know, Maybe I'll t tell a little story there because I've heard two or three nurses and a few doctors from the States say that um, if you put a person on a respirator and sedate them for X amount of days, they will all come out with a brain injury. I've heard them say this recently because of COVID, because in, with their saying, what they've said in various interviews and so on is that with COVID, one is changing the protocols in the hospitals. So instead of putting people with a slight respiratory problem on a mask or just giving them oxygen in the nose, so usually you would start in a gentle fashion. One was putting them on the respiratory respirators immediately, saying, you're very ill, you're very ill. So that's why Trump was saying, we need respirators, we need respirators, because they're actually changing the protocols. So they changed the protocols in the hospital to bring these respirators in as fast as possible. And these doctors are saying, this is the death sentence. Once you're on the respirator, because nobody will stay on a respirator, you have to sedate them severely. So they're sedated as well. And this is what the children do, and this is what the adults do, you have to strap them. Because even though you're severely sedated, you will pull it out. Did they also strap people who went into the hospital because of testing positive for, for coronavirus? That's what some of these people have said. I don't know. I'm not in the hospitals and I don't know people there, but and they're saying that I've seen the video. So they put them on this ventilator, this mask, oxygen mask, mm. and sedated it's them? It's not a mask. It's a tube. It's a tube down. So the tube is severely different than just a mask. Mm -hmm. So it's a pressurized air constantly to the lungs. So the lungs don't work on their own anymore. They work from the machine. So people died from this? what they're saying that it's actually a kind this is also on an inter or uh, the ITNG did a, ITNJ did a a session where they had a doctor there and she said it's it's the death sentence to put these people on the respirators and then they can put COVID-19 on the death of certificate. course yeah but what I was going to say about the children premature children are always put on these things if they have a little problem breathing so it's very easy to take a premature child and just shove the tube in and then, of course, you have to sedate them to get them to not keep pulling it out. So you sedate them and you strap their hands for a few days. And then many of them end up with cerebral palsy. So I'm, when I'm hearing this, I'm feeling, 
<clears throat> confirmed in some of my thoughts that I've had for a long time. We actually treat, teach parents to do the techniques because these are such severe individuals. So we don't treat them ourselves, we teach the parents. So here in Denmark, it goes under a home training program. The, t the parents of children with cerebral palsy or other developmental difficulties have a right on, after the law to g enter a home training program instead of the official offer for daily care or whatever the Danish government offers them. So the parents in Denmark have been, were very, very active and are still very active to get this home training law passed. And did you get into this because of your of you studying Rudolf Steiner and all of that? Not at all. I got into it because I have a child with handicap with disability who's, who's also born premature. Uh huh. So uh, people have called Rudolf Steiner uh, both a respected scholar but also a mad occultist. And even though his school system was very alternative to the ordinary public school system that we all know and his teaching methods has been highly praised by many. He has also been called a Nazi sympathizer and a racist. And you've been studying his work thoroughly for so long. What do you say to people that, that say that he was actually a na Nazi sympathizer and a racist? Well, if you compare to the first thing you read about the individual thoughts and the power of the thought and the importance of the individual, you can start to wonder already, right? Because the individual and race are two completely different things. And even the Nazis, and when I lived in East Germany, the, the newspapers or whoever, the journalists got access to the files from the, some of the Nazis because it was closed behind the East German border and some of these then, these archives were open and they could see that the Nazis actually wrote about Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy, although Rudolf Steiner had already been dead for 10 years and so on. But the, even the Nazis described it as something, as being an antithesis to National Socialism, to the Nazi program, because they said Rudolf Steiner's, what Rudolf Steiner was teaching and the Waldorf schools, which were already quite widespread in Germany, that's against our race understanding, because it's about the individual. So the Nazis got it, but the journalists today aren't very thorough. They do not do the due diligence, diligence to really research what's behind it. So if I say the word race, does it mean I'm a racist? No, I just use the word race. So if we say there is, there is a history behind the races or the development of the races, and I say that one race is better than the others, those are two different things, a history. So one of the things I read recently, and I am not a thorough scholar, you can't think I've read hundreds of things, I, read slowly and I kind of try to digest it a little bit. One thing I read recently was that um, the idea of race has nothing to do with anthroposophy, in Rudolf Steiner's words, and not even with, with the reality. Race belongs to the history that race has developed years ago. Bef and we know this, I took Anthropology 101, you know, race is before, the development of the race is before writing, culture, history, remembrance. That's the races, the races emerged before, what we have now is cultural development, the, the development of the culture. So we have streams of culture. It has nothing to do with race. And it, no matter which stream of culture you are living in, you have the same access to this inside voice. So it's completely transcends race. It is nothing about racism. So these journalists, unfortunately, did not do their research very well to say that he's a racist because it's the opposite of racism. It's so it's like labeling somebody f because of an agenda or what? Because he doesn't like his teachings or his way of, let's say, prescribing to, to, to the in individual? It's not very popular today to prescribe to the individual because then we can't get Agenda 2020 in by 2020 or 2030 because the voices inside are getting stronger for those who are listening to them. You start to listen to the voice inside, and I gave you a little bit of my history that I was standing in these barns saying, 
does it have to be like this? I don't think so. I knew there's something else, but I was just trying to see how they do it. You know, I was trying to learn it, thought it might be something for me. But the voices are getting stronger in all of us. Um, of course, many people want to comply and because people want to be good, be a good citizen, show that they are able, they're, they're thinking about the 80 year olds, you know, so they take the mask on so they don't kill their grandma um, or somebody else's grandma. So it's actually done in a certain way of responsibility that people want to wear the mask. They're not just stupid. They want to take care of other people. It's just normal. We don't want to hurt anybody. So you use something that everybody has and try to change their behavior with these masks. If we get back to this. It's like hijacking the good. The good mm. and and people with empathy. Mm. Trying to use people who are very well empathetic mm. to to comply to all of this. Of course. And of course think that if you don't want to wear a mask, then you are really being a very very Bad person, bad person to other people mm -hmm. not caring for them mm -hmm. because they haven't looked into what this whole situation is all about exactly really yeah. one of the things i think we really have to start understanding is that we can change things by understanding and this whole awakening movement which is getting bigger one could say it seems to be getting bigger I don't know you have much more contact with this movement than I do actually but it is widening out it's very focused on what's bad you know fear and oh what are they doing and what are they thinking up and in the end I think we have to be relaxed and but on the same time focused and realize they have long plans and Wudersteiner was very good at talking about their plans and I think actually he was very kind. He called them the Black Brotherhoods, for example. Now we can call them what they are because they expose themselves as worse than that. You know, they're not just Black Brotherhoods and organizations. Of, they're really gone into very deep darkness with what they're doing with the children and all these things. That We're talking about the 1%. We're talking about these bloodline families, the top elite mm -hmm. that we don't hear a lot about, which are way uh, um, up there on, on the pyramid structure, way above the regular p politicians and heads of states and all of that. What people have referred to as the Illuminati and, and other things, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, please talk about how do you understand this structure? What is going on there? We are hearing a lot about them being Satanists and doing satanic rituals, occult dark rituals. Why do you think they're doing that? To increase their power base, to get the things through that they want to get through, to change the society, to change people in such a way to mold them into certain goals. And the, there's one thing he does, the, he explo exposed them already in, especially after World War I, spent a lot of time exposing their plans. You can find their lectures, it's many lectures. He exposed what they're doing, he exposed how the brotherhoods work, he exposed um, how the Jesuits work and so on. So they, and he even said himself, after he held one series of lectures, I think it's called From Jesus to Christ, as what is Jesus, what is Christ, so a series of lectures in Karlsruhe, then he spoke about the Jesuits and their spiritual practices and so on. And then at that moment he said, our opposition movement started. From that moment on, the opposition to anthroposophy really got going, and it got very big, and it hasn't stopped today. Um, but the one reason they keep it quiet is because if we say too much, people will start to be attentive to what's going on. So they do not criticize him as much as they would like to. But if you really look at everything that happened in anthroposophy, or are coming out, let's say coming out of this sort of impulse from his students and from him, his, his teachings, so what happened was that the people who were hearing what he was talking about, and then they were asking, yeah, okay, that's very interesting, but what can we do with the school? Oh, that's pretty interesting, but I want to make farming. How could I do it differently? Oh, that's very interesting. Can we have a new medicine here? We want to, have, we want to treat people. We don't want to do this other stuff. We want to know how can we use this knowledge to treat people. So he wasn't saying make a new medicine, 
But this is how the whole blossoming started, that people who were in the professional areas, and then including what I would like to talk about, the social organics or the threefold social organism, after World War I, they were saying, oh my God, this is chaos. Look what we've done to Europe. Look what we've done to our societies. And our friends over in that country, in that country, have been killing each other. We have to do something. This so is people started asking questions. Is that it? Yeah, especially after World War I. The questions were just like, please, let's have a course about this. The economists and the, the socially political people were saying, we need to have courses about this. We need to have this. He, and, and then, okay, this is apparently the law. If you are an occult teacher on the good side, the white side, and this is what we have to know very clearly, there is the black side and there is the white side. And this is the picture which I know is true. From the revelations of St. John, there is this imagination of the being with the sword in his mouth, with the flames. What is this being? It's the one that you meet when you go over the threshold into the spiritual world. You meet this being. He may not look like he looks in the pictures. He may not look like a cartoon, which you might have seen somewhere. But this being tells you, you have to decide. And when you meet this being, you decide, do I use this knowledge that I'm getting for the good of mankind, for the good of all my brothers and sisters on this world and the whole planet, or do I use it for my personal gains? Because you can use that knowledge both ways. So that's why they are into the occult. They like it. They like Rudolf Steiner. They love him. They get so much from him, and nobody else does, very few, who are active today, get what he gave them. But they take it all the time and they hijack it. And they use it for bad, huh? Of course. So this is about dualism. This is about yin-yang. It's about the opposites. It, in that way that you have to decide, right? That In that moment you have to decide, or many moments, you know, in your life, you're always making this decision. So it's a continuous decision you're making. But if you are because Rudolf Steiner is giving spiritual knowledge of how to open the eyes in, this, in the way to, that you can see in the spiritual world. But he's also telling people you have to strengthen your moral life. You have to strengthen your own inner being at the same time. You don't want to go over that threshold until you've done it. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to mess yourself up. So that's a he didn't say it like this. I'm saying it in popular language, but... And where is that th threshold? Where is that threshold? Very interesting. I mean, where's the threshold for him, for the Western world, for the Western impulse, which we can say without being racist, there's a stream, you know, it started there in India and it moved to Persia, it moved to Egypt, it moved to Greece and Rome, it spread out into Europe. So there's this, this wave of culture. Yeah? For this wave of culture, there, this, what, what was the culmination? It came into this thinking world where we think all the time. And people didn't used to think the way we think now. So they teach us in schools to think that those old Egyptians, they were just stupid, right? Or the Greeks, they were stupid and they didn't know why there was thunder. I learned this in three, third grade, you know, because they couldn't explain thunder and lightning. They, they invented Poseidon. But this is not how things were. This is not. This is against common sense. Do you think peoples around the entire world were inventing gods for things they didn't understand? I don't think they were like. They did never made sense to me in any case. They were seeing spiritual beings. They experienced beings around them all the time. And but what do you I, think I, they I were? What do you think they were? Do you think that they were actually, let's say, deities, or or were they? Aliens? I don't think they were aliens. I think they're deities. Definitely. What's the difference? Because a lot of people in, uh, who believe in Christianity, for example, they think that fallen angels and angels and, and you know, that, that aliens are what, what other people uh, who are Christian call fallen angels who came here and populated the earth, basically. Well, the, you know, you put that little quote on your Facebook page some months ago about if you imagine what the spiritual world is like, you cannot imagine it's like anything here. From Rudolf Steiner, remember that? So this was what inspired me to, to call you. So this quote is very good because the spiritual world, it does not look like our spaceships. 
and the aliens, our imagination of a, an alien, for example. But do you believe that there are uh, beings from other planetary systems, it's, alien beings, extraterrestrials, and interdimensionals as, as well, which may not be manifesting in you know, our three-dimensional three realm? Well, some things I just haven't gone so deeply into to know how much is the physical incarnation and how much do these beings exist. So what exists? So let's say I have this glass of water. I haven't been drinking. But the first kind of early exercises in the thinking, think a thought and keep it in your head. You know? So this is Rudersteiner. So one of the exercises for developing your inner spiritual capacities, just hold the thought. All right, that's very difficult, you know. You start with one thought and then you're thinking about this. And, but to just keep bringing it back to the glass. So if we started describing this glass, how long do you think we would sit here before we finished? It could be six weeks, right? Just all the thoughts develop around this glass, you know. So, okay, wow, it's this glass. I have this water here, but just imagine I didn't have a glass. What would be my life be like? So you only know that when you've tried to drink water like this. So there's hundreds and thousands of ideas. Yeah, that and everything all is connect. made of atoms, right? And atoms have no solidity. So if you go like really close to it, which we, we are not able to do, everything well dissolves. And then well, and that's then, what they've taught us, yeah. And then that's basically that makes everything kind of holographic in a sophisticated way, huh? Well, then you have to, this is where then Mudo San would say to you in that thought, go back to the phenomena. You have to study the phenomena, see how you uh, experience. So the whole science that developed out of anthroposophy, one can call it, it's a phenom phenomenology. It is, you study the phenomena and then you connect the thinking and you have to test it all the time. So I could think like the false thoughts about the glass, like for example, if I came with a bulldozer, I could have this thought, oh, it's very strong, look, it's holding all that water there, and I could come the bulldozer and drive over it and nothing would happen. So I have to test these things. Is the bulldozer going to break it or not? Okay, so then I know I had a false thought. But I, can, I always have to be testing these things. So the things about the atoms, hmm, this is very interesting. I have, to, I have to digest these thoughts. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've never seen an atom. We can't see them, but well, we are it's part a of it. It's in front of us, but we can, well, we can't see it. If we go like really close to things, mm -hmm. they dissolve. So nothing basically exists, and yet everything exists huh? everything at the same exists. time. Well, this is the thing that then this kind of science, based on so much you can't see, on mathematical formulas which are very complex, based on electron microscopes or even even more developed microscopes that see things that the eye cannot see and so on. This is an interesting field to follow and there's much based on it. It can develop technology. And we only use our five senses in as terms well, of, as, as, as I as mean, as in as terms as well. of what we see here, taste, feel. Well, we have more know. senses. We of already course. know we have much more senses than that. Of so course, there's even the just thing. connected to the physical, there's already, you know, Rudestein talked about 12 senses. We have a sense of thought as well, a sense of speech. We have a sense of, of movement. We have, so there's quite a few senses already here, but then we have these spiritual capacities which we can work on and develop. So the thing, what I was saying about the cultural development, those the eyes that saw deities, they were closing. They closed, the spiritual eyes were closing, the chakras, you know. Mm -hmm. So these chakras, in different stages, different chakras were still open, and then these, it's part of our destiny that they close. This is what Rudolf Steiner was teaching people. They close so that we, more and more, can choose, be free, because if the gods were standing around us, and you saw an angel over your shoulder every time you wanted to to steal something, you wouldn't be very free or think certain thoughts or whatever. We wouldn't be free unless our eyes for the spiritual close down. So the task for now is that we, through our own work, our own individual development, say, this is our work, we're going to go that way. We and if we learn it. to understand energy and also numbers and structures, really, huh? because everything is numbers, basically, in this matrix. And also the pineal gland, which is the third eye, you know, and it's been basically calcified on most people. You've heard Ben David 
she wrote a book about that. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she was on our show as well. But I mean, a lot of people are really talking about the pineal gland at the moment because it seems to be quite hijacked. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, access mm. because of fluoride, fluoride and GMO food and uh, well, electromagnetic radiation and poison and pollution. But also there are physical organs, which are also the organs of the spirituality. So we have centers for them in our body. So the heart is also, there's the heart chakra. Yeah, so our heart is also an organ that can see one day. It will be, a, it is also in the Buddhism, it's very clear that there's the heart chakra. And this heart chakra we can work on. And it Which is stronger than the mind, huh? or I mean, it's stronger than the brain, at least the brain waves. What they talk about law, law of attraction, you have to feel something. And it's not just the thought in your mind, it actually, it's actually the vibration from the heart wanting it feeling it hmm. these can talk together right so they can speak and you can have feelings that have uh, have a shape like thoughts you can have thoughts that can feel as well so we can have very abstract thoughts we can have thoughts about it's good to, it would be good to control people it would be good to do this we can have completely abstract thoughts in all levels of life and this is the problem with our modern science that it left the heart it didn't ask the heart anymore. Do we really want to treat animals like this if we talk about my life? Or do we really want to teach, treat children like this? Or do we really want um, to do medicine like this? Which is, you know, give as many toxic substances as possible and make as much money on the side so that everybody's happy. We give, we give chronic diseases at an early age and we have them in, you know, we give them food that's poison. We make sure the water is poison. And then everyone says, we can't do anything about it. It's just progress. We put, we give them the phones. It kills them. It causes cancers. It causes this, it causes that. Everybody wants it, you know? So there's very, our thoughts can be extremely disassociated, but the thoughts can also become part of our organ of understanding. Thoughts are the key, but also the heart is the key. Both of them are keys. So the thoughts can develop, but we have to take our heart with us when we develop the thoughts. So we, we're not in the stage right now where we should go further with these abstract thoughts and completely abstract that are cold, devoid of any association or contact to humanity, to the earth, to the earth's development, to the future of what man is supposed to be able to become. And everybody needs the chance. Today, everybody needs the chance. So you have to connect head and heart. Exactly. And of course, then the will as well. We have to do something. We have to then decide, okay, what are the steps? What's the step for tomorrow? What's the step for the next day? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And you are the, the initiator and the representative for the In Power Movement here in Denmark, which is a division here in Denmark of what um, a gentleman named Cal Washington that we also had on our show here, he created this movement. And he also created something called Notice of Liability. And you know a lot about this, of course, and you are really into what the whole In Power mo Movement is, what can be done with it, how you can, in a way, renounce the state and renounce your so-called contract with the state, as you have talked about. But please explain all of this to our viewers. What is the In Power Movement? And eventually, what is the notice of liability and how can this be implemented or used? All right. I'm I'm, it was just by chance I became this representative. I watched the film, or I saw somewhere on Facebook, first of all, it was a vaccine group where one mother was writing, oh, I'm afraid they're going to take away my children if I don't get a vaccine. This is back in 2017. I saw that on Facebook, and somebody wrote just, don't worry, in power movement. And I was a little bit, oh, what could that be? So I clicked there, and I went to watch the first video I saw was called Take Back Your Power from Josh Del Sol. And I thought, this is interesting. Okay, they spoke about creating seed groups in different areas. So I wrote and said, we want to start a seed group in Denmark. 
and I waited two years and then I finally got the answer but I kept writing and and in the summer one year ago in I think May 2019 I received an email oh, from them and they said we're now ready to start in Denmark so therefore I became the first person here to start working on this project so then we started trying to find people to work and the first um, the first thing for me was, oh, we have to, tra we had to, they told us we have to translate it to Danish, which I'm obviously not the person to do. And then all the Danish people, which I tried to drag into this, they realized, oh my goodness, translate this to Danish. We don't have the words for this. We don't have the words for notice. A liability, is there a word for that? Is there a word for all these sort of judicial terms was very difficult. Trying to understand what is our judicial system. And there are many people now who are uncovering this. And there's been, for example, Sasha Stone had an interview with Bibi Bachus on Bibi Bachus. She was completely fraudulent, was put in jail for seven years. And um, during the time she was put in jail, having done nothing, her family started bringing her research material because she couldn't understand, why am I here? I did nothing. And it, she was kind of maybe set up or something like this. So she's, there's an inter interesting interview with her, which one can watch. And um, she, so she started researching into uniform commercial code and commercial law. And this is what Cal Washington was also doing in his journey, was trying to find out why is the system like this that we always lose? What is this going on in the judicial system? Why do we have no influence? Why do we always lose? We have the best evidence, but we lose the case, for example. So he was, and him and a group of friends were starting to test the system and then finding out through through researching well there is no law about paying taxes there is no law about registering your car there is no law about this there is no law about that so this is also I've been reading about this for years but more on the fringe uh, that oh they found out there's no law for income tax in America so people were pr trying to not pay it. We also interviewed uh, a lady named Ingun Sikorstad. Ingun, yeah, she's researched that quite a bit as well. Of course, for uh, which people can watch on our mm. channel as well, mm. who renounced the state and mm. gave up her citizenship and her passport and everything mm. for for a while and became quite famous in Norway for, mm. for, for doing that. But uh, more and more people are doing that at the moment as they are learning and discovering that their entire life and their and their citizenship is a number that they are a contract under the state, huh? Mm. And um, just to get it a little bit clear, the notice of liability doesn't take you out of the state. So what the notice of liability does is it takes the situation as it is and says, we know how it is. <laughs> so it's a document of about 15 pages. And this document, is created to be able to stop certain agendas. So the one being this so-called trespassing technology, which is a nice word in English for the smart meters. That's the first notice of liability. The second one, which is already finished in the United States is the 5G one and the vaccines for forced vaccination. And then the geoengineering one is also very well prepared. So these are documents which can work with completely within the system because they understand the system. So the, uh, the knowledge which Cal Washington and similar people working in similar areas have uncovered is that we, have, we think that we're in one jurisdiction of law and we actually are not. Or we, because the governments are functioning under corporate law, commercial law. So there's an entirely other jurisdiction that we don't know about. And because they have converted everything to corporations, so the communes all have in Denmark the tax numbers, the, everything is a corporation. They the local communities, huh? Yeah, or? our communes, our municipalities in Denmark, they're, all, they're companies now. In America it's the same thing. All the countries around the world have privatized their governments. So this is okay, you privatize your government, then they're a corporation and then they can work very easily, even though they were doing it anyway before, but they can work very easily under commercial law. So the government and the state is a, corp uh, well, a corporation. Yeah, of course. We did, I mean, we didn't know that. I say, of course. A year ago, I didn't, 
I sort of knew they privatized everything, but I didn't really realize the magnitude of these discoveries. So it's a business. It's just a business. And we've known it's a business here in Denmark, if I use that example, because, you know, we learned that the Embis men were running the things and they were running it as a business and they were saving money. The counselors or what? what is that word in English? I don't know. The advisors or something like that. The people advising the communes what to do with their budget, for example. So these, they were running it as a business, obviously. Um, but the extent and the magnitude. So that the business that each country is actually they have their registrations in America on the United States Security and Exchange Commission. So that you have to register there if you're a big corporation. So we've been sort of finding these corporations. Denmark has been harder to find, but many of the countries have been easy to find. So they're registered. But Denmark is also registered through the European International Bank. Is that the name of it? Nay, the, nay, the Bank of International Settlements. In, which, in Basel, in Switzerland. No, that's not the one I'm thinking. I'm thinking of another one. There's the ECB, there's that one, and there's another bank. Anyway, where the the 25 or 25 countries of Europe are all shareholders in this bank. And this bank is registered on the United States Security and Exchange Commission as a foreign government. What's a foreign government? <laughs> so, and its shareholders are all the countries, Spain, Germany, da, 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 down here, Denmark as a smaller shareholder, depending on the population, but it's registered as a foreign government as well. So they are all operating under commerce. Commercial law is something different. and. Cal Washington studied the history, uncovered all the information about Lex Mercatoria, which is the old commercial law. So in the old days, there was the Lex Mercatoria, which was how the merchants did things. So the merchants had their own courts and they had their own laws because it was about commerce. It was something else. It was, there was, so there was a split already. And in the English countries, there was the common law. In the more European countries, there's the civil law. So, so, so is the merchant law the same as the civil law? No, it's not. But in, in the 1700s, there was a Lord Mansfield who merged the common law with the Lex Mercatoria, with the merchant law. It got merged. And this is very interesting. Instead of more differentiation, you have more chaos. <laughs> it's just a very good way to do things. Divide so, and conquer. Or just mix it up, you know, so they don't see. So they can't really understand what's going on. So they mix, they mix them together. They blended it, which was actually laws for two different parts of life. If you decide what to do with some criminal or if you decide how to do commerce, those are two different things. They should be kept apart. But they merged it together. So common law was merged with that in the English, in the Commonwealth, let's say. But in the rest of Europe, as far as I can see, and I, I, it's been hard to find where this common law is. It's, it's a jurisdiction maybe, but probably not in the same way because we have civil law here. And civil law is Roman law coming from Rome. And in the time of Rome, that's when the citizen really became somebody because you could have rights. Before that, people didn't really have rights. Of course, in Greece, in ancient Greece, there were rights and there were women's rights. For example, I f heard from my anthropology teacher in the university, well, there were all these rights. The women's, if she got married, all the, the weavings she brought into the marriage, her dowry, if she brought plates, if she brought this, if she brought that, that was her. She could take it if she got a divorce. It was her right to keep her things. So there were rights in Greece, but really in Rome, you became somebody who could have a testament, you know, you could have a will. After you're dead, you could still do things with your possessions. So that was what happened in Rome, that the citizens were there and they got rights and so on. But this Roman rule then spread out through Europe because the Roman Empire wasn't happy in Rome. It wanted more. So they were taking in this country, taking in that country, and they had a certain system of doing it. So with their system of taking over the religious areas, and that was their system, they wrote, wrote about it themselves, that they knew the way to take over an area was to go and burn down the temple, take the statues to Rome, destroy the deities, destroy the cult, which the people were so connected to, and then we had them all. So people, this shows us as well that people were different then because they were so connected to their cult, 
Well, they're also taking down statues 2020. You see it. You see it, even though an American is not connected to a statue, but still they're doing it. As an American, I don't know where any statues of anybody is. I don't have a connection to Abraham Lincoln's statue there. I don't think very many do. But still, you can still do the things. It has a, it has a certain symbolic value to do that. But in Rome, it was the way they did it. It was their war plan. So if they want, when they wanted to take over the part of Europe, which is France, well, what do we do? We go to the cult center of the Druids. So the Druid cult was in Chartres. They burned it down. They took the gods home in 50 years before Christ's birth around then. They took over the, the holy center of the Druids. They destroyed it. They burned it. They killed some priests and they took the, the gods home. Then they moved the religious center to another city. They created a city. They created some gods. And then they, had the, they took tons of slaves, too, because then you pacify everyone. They don't know how to orient themselves. They didn't in those days. Now we're different. We are not connected to these kind of things. We're not also, we're not geologically connected anywhere in that way that the people were then. So that was their war plan. And after that, so then there was Christ's birth and so on. And their, their system kept going. The next place they wanted to get was the Scandinavian tribe. So that was northern Germany and southern Scandinavia. And they gave the name to this area. The name comes from the Romans, the Germanen, the Germans. That's a Roman word. And then they started the series of three huge, what do you call it, when the massive troops, they sent up, imagine moving 30,000 troops in Roman times with all the food you need for them, all the salt, all the flour, all the dried meat, and all the cooks, and all the pages, and you know everyone who took care of armor and everything. You move this from Rome up to southern, uh, northern Germany, where the Externstein is. So Externstein was the center of the Germanic people, and they tried three times, and I didn't research exactly the years, but it's about six or nine, 11 and 13. They came up three times. They crossed all the rivers, they built bridges, they transported all these things there, and they tried to fight wars to take they thought it would go easy, like it did in, in France and lo like it did at, with all the other tribes of Europe, because Euro Europe was composed of tribes. And it was easy enough if you could take the centers to just take, the, take over the whole area. But the Germanen knew by then what to do. So this is a very interesting story. I found this book that I, I saw it 20 or 30 years ago, and I, I bought it from a friend, and I still have it. And I never finished it until this Christmas. But in this, in this history book, this historian, he's a war historian, he, he describes this whole process, how the, the leader of the Germanic tribes, so they, they did, the Germanic tribes, they joined together when it was absolutely ne necessary. Otherwise, they all had their own laws and their own jurisdictions. But when there was a huge um, problem, they would join together. So the one who led them, he knew we have to get the Romans to fight here in our holy place and then we can win. So they, they got, they brought the, he led the Romans there. The Romans came there three times and they destroyed them with axes. They didn't even have weapons. They destroyed the Romans three times. So that meant in these years, going up to like 13, maybe 20 after Christ's birth, the Romans stopped the project. They say, it's not going to work, we're not going to do it. So they left it until Charlemagne, Karl the Great, was finally able to destroy the Exenstein, which he did in 760. So the Romans also wanted to do like a global takeover, at least of Europe. At least of Europe, yes. And they, they were able to spread out because then the Romans didn't really mind which gods they had. You know, which they, was what Hitler wanted as well, huh? You know, I haven't really studied what Hitler wanted so much. I haven't studied it. But he, one says he wanted to... What he, well, he based a lot on, you know, uh, what he did on, uh, you know, the, the Roman way. Of course, they all the do. The presentation as he well. He wasn't the only one. <laughs> He's not the only one, unfortunately. It's no. still alive today. The Roman, the Roman way is alive and working. It runs Europe. It runs European Union. Um, but in those days, they, would, they brought the bishops then. So they spread out Rome through Europe by using Christianity as what's 
inside because they never, they were always accepting the gods. Like they stole gods from Greece. If you ever studied um, sculpture, you know there are Roman copies. So you go into a museum and you always look there and say, is this the real one or is this the Roman copy? Because Romans were always making copies of sculptures. So they were, they were, they were very good at taking things in. So they, t they were taking in the Greek gods, then they took in these gods, and then they took in those gods. Then they took in, okay, it took a few hundred years, then they took in Christianity, and they realized it was quite useful. And there were many religious people there, of course, that were deeply religious in Christianity, but there was also the Roman way, and the Roman Empire was a god. So that's what Rome did. They turned their Caesar into a god, they put him there on the, on the statue and the pedestal, and it was he was the God. So there was a certain discrepancy there because Christianity said, you know, Christ came and said, the God is in you. The kingdom of heaven is in you. Okay, this is a polarity. This is something that doesn't fit together, but it worked for the Romans. It worked for the Roman thought, the thought of spreading out, getting a whole area of the world, bringing Christianity, using the bishops as the courts. So the bishop was the court which brought Roman rule to Europe. The Germanic tribes did not want it. They did not want because they didn't like forced taxation. And this is very interesting that the German, Germanic tribes, the Scandinavian tribes, did not accept forced taxation because you would only pay taxes for something you wanted to pay taxes for. So there were voluntary taxation, but not forced taxation. So what they really did, the Romans, they wanted to create a one world order. Well, they were the star they were, you know, they were on this way of the one world order. Mm -hmm. But and it may have had its cultural validity going up to a certain time, but then it stopped, right? Now it's over. The Roman rule is over. This idea that we can create a one world government and force everybody through taxation, you know, taxation is a way to make people poor and make people work harder for just the economic base so they don't have time for culture and development. And they call it the new world order, but in reality it's the old world order. It's huh? a very old, it's a very old system. So that's why this, you know, this nice pyramid, it's also from Egypt. Let's bring it here. It was fine in Egypt, this triangle. Because in Egypt, it was the pharaoh and his sister wife, you know, so with bloodlines as well. They married as sister and brother. We learned this in anthropology and whatever we took then those days, that the sister and brother, they were at the top of this pyramid. And many historians, they even wrote, you know, the, if you want to understand Egyptian culture, you have to understand the pharaoh, because the pharaoh controlled everything, the whole thing. He decided when to plant, he decided how to do the agriculture. He decided how the scribes would work. He decided what art forms were used. He had the, the line to God and his priests controlled the religious cult, the money system, everything. So you understand the Pharaoh of the time, you understand the period of the Egyptian culture. But this is not how we are now, my goodness. We don't fit anymore. We don't fit in the bloodlines. We fight with our sisters and brothers over opinions and so on. We don't talk to each other because one thinks this about Trump and the other one thinks about something else. Um, we, people are individualizing more and more and more. So the bloodlines, which were all important earlier, and that's what you see. I mean, I took 101 in anthropo anthropology in university, but I also took like another course, six number four or something like that. And then our uh, teacher, then the professor, he tried to make us under, or help us to understand that Christianity was like a huge revolution in the world because the religions up to that time followed the bloodlines. They followed the bloodlines or your social status or your location. That was all the religions. So the Judaism was based on where, who you're born to. And this is into today. I had many Jewish friends and they always talked about, well, we can't date non-Jews, the Goys. We Have you studied the Kabbalah? No, not yet. <laughs> but still, this professor is telling us, you know, Christianity, nobody knew where to put it in the beginning because the Jews didn't know, is it for us? The Romans uh, didn't know, is it for us? The Greeks didn't know, is it for us? And the ones who were connected with Christianity didn't know who it was for. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea that there could be a religion 
that goes beyond local areas, cultural areas, um, that didn't exist. So there was huge amounts of discussion in early Christianity about these things. And one knows there's this St. Paul who became, he wrote the letters to the Corinthians. He was writing letters to everyone in documents saying, this could be for you. <laughs> this could be for you. So Roman law, how is that connected to today's civil law or and common law that you speak about and that, that people within the, this in power movement mm -hmm. are talking about? Mm -hmm. And natural law. What is what is the difference here and what can we use if well if people want to be sovereign being beings not being part of the state mm -hmm. under this so-called contract that you talk about So the one thing is that there is a movement going on where people are trying to free them up themselves up from these contracts and then there is on the, another thing called the in power movement so these aren't one and the same thing but the in power movement uses the knowledge and has created a document within this knowledge base which will work within the system we have now because it understands the system. Um, it's not based on common law in that way. It's based on a multi-jurisdictional um, status. So it creates a status which I believe is true that you can do. You create a jurisdictional status within the document and then operates on multi-levels. So it can operate on the spiritual jurisdiction. Natural law is in the, in the word book, like in the Danish dictionary, it says natural law is something that refers to higher spiritual jurisdictions and, not, and laws that are not man-made. It goes back to Aristoteles and it goes back to Thomas from Aquino. This idea of natural law, that the, law, the laws which exist have to reflect a higher Status. So this is something that natural law takes reference to. Um, civil law, something coming from the Romans, coming from the Roman time, which we have in Europe. We have our law is based on civil law. Common law is based on precedence law. So it's not just laws that's codified in the books, but in common law the system was more, what did the judge decide last month? What did the judge decide 100 years ago? So this is how the common law system was built up. So it's a little bit different. Roman law was based on a lot of codes and paragraphs, and the other was based on precedence. This is just a generalization. So the notice of liability is not based on common law. It's not, not really based on civil law, although it does operate within the civil as well. Um, it's based on higher jurisdictions and what is the highest jurisdiction it is our connection to the spiritual world so it has references to the bible as being a book which they all swore on up until a few years ago in europe but they still swear on the bible if you're in a coronational oath or you were as mary uh, elizabeth the queen of england she swore on the bible they all swear on the book because their power comes from somewhere else, or at least they want to show us this. So it operates within the jurisdictions, and it is using the knowledge of contracts. That's the main thing about the notice of liability, that the understanding of what a contract is and how a contract works makes the document so powerful. So the problem which we are all facing today is that we are in commerce all the time, and we do not know that they are functioning in commercial law. So the commercial law is based on contract. That means I make the first thing that you do if you want to create a contract is to make an offer. So Cal discovered, Cal Washington, that actually it's just an offer to get a smart meter. It's an offer that you could have 5G. And they told us about it. They told us because they put it in the newspaper. They sent you a little notice that we're coming on Thursday to change out your analog to a digital meter. They told us that they're going to vaccinate us soon. We're all going to have to have it. Now they're really telling us. But this is a commercial offer. Once you know it's a commercial offer, you have to say, okay, we can deal with it in commercial. So we are corporations through our birth certificates. They created us to corporations. So this is all about the trust account. People who are interested can go and research the CESTV trust account or the straw man account. So they create, they trade in the birth certificate for 
another certificate of being a person. So a person is not a live man and woman in their language. A person is something else. So you are a corporation. Well, a sales object? Of also, yes. <laughs> so through that nice little trade of the of the documents, you we have all become a corporation. So now we can say, okay, thank you very much. We know what to do. We're in corporate law or we're in commerce. We know it's an offer. And this is Cal's work and research, which I'm just parroting. What he, I believe it's probably true, that if you have gotten an offer in commerce, you can't say no, but you can say a conditional yes. Because it's dishonorable to say no, I don't want, and let's fight against, and let's go on the, on the, on the street and protest and do all that. That's actually not honorable in commerce. You have to always say yes, but. You can say yes, but. Or you can say, whereas, it seems like. You can make conditions, so you can take a conditional acceptance. And then the contract is valid and it's running. So we say yes, this contract, which Cal is finishing. So Cal has finished this contract, and we in the different countries around the world, now 16 countries are ready to get it out, have adjusted it to our own countries. So one says, yes, thank you very much for your offer. We will, of course, accept this interesting thing you're installing in my house but first you have to prove to me whereas it seems as if it is dangerous for our health whereas it seems as if it is collecting data this is against the law whereas it seems as if it is part of a worldwide agenda and there's a long list so it goes on for 20 pages so this the notice of liability has already they've already started sending it out over the years to many officials so-called corporate officials, government officials, people who are pushing these various agendas. And then when they get the document, they cannot say no anymore because it was them who started the contract. So once you've started a contract and made an offer, you cannot step down. Everybody knows this. It's against the law to put in the papers that we're going to sell all the cars in our place for two crowns or two dollars, right? We can't write that because everyone will come we have to do it. So people could say no to smart meters or what? That's the thing. You can say no. So that did happen. It has happened in USA. Using no, the, the notice of liability. Mm -hmm. That for... then they were given options to opt out or some, some communities actually stopped the whole thing. But it hasn't been used widely. So when they started it, giving out the notice of liability, there was a lot of, then they realized what a huge thing this was and how difficult it was going to be. So then they have been working very hard for several years now to get a whole platform finished so that people can become members of In Power Movement. You pay your $10 a month. And then as soon as this platform is open, and it is very, very close now, then we can get access to documents, which we can send in the correct manner to the people we choose, but they will help us. That means we will help everybody to make sure we have the right addresses. People who are really in the agenda or have the, the duty of responsibility. Because so it's still in the works. It's not functioning at the moment. No, there have been many, many stones and hurdles. It has not been easy because of course you need a huge server. So then you're in the IT world they're not so happy because they find out, oh, there's something against vaccines. So many, they had huge amount of works that were almost finished and then they were, were told uh, that the companies uh, actually did not complete the contracts with them. But now it seems like it's really going to get opened quite soon. Mm -hmm. And people probably need this more than ever if they want to look into this and actually, well, be serious about this. Mm. Although it's very, very difficult for a lot of people to just renounce their citizenship or, or the state and actually understand that whole entangled web there that, that well, you're talking about. huh? Well, this is why also one of the reasons in power movement has been taking so long because you do not have to do that. First of all, the document is crafted in such a way you do not have to do that. That's something separate. You, you declare yourself a living man, a living woman, and that's enough. I am a living woman. I'm writing this, so you're a living woman. So it's declared because it's a document. And the other thing is, is once it's sent to somebody, in order to answer it, you have to rebut every point on it. And if they do not rebut, 
they do what they expect us to do all the time and they go into tacit consent. So everything that the state or organizations or companies, they want you to do and say this is the rules and the, and the law, mm -hmm. it's actually an offer, it's a contract it's an offer. and then you can make a counter offer. You have your own contract and you can say I'm not having that or if I'm if I should have this, then at least th there should be no side effects to the vaccines or problems, side effects coming from radiation, rigging up radiation right. from smart meters or 5G mm -hmm. uh, or whatever they're whatever, doing, yeah. which can be very difficult because they're rigging that up all over. All over, yeah. So it's finishing the contract, actually, because they make a contract with us, but they don't finish it. And because they say it is a maxim of law that tacit consent is a maxim. If you do not say no, you have said yes. So they start the contract and once they start it, they cannot re go out of it. And if they do not follow their rules within the merchant law, then they let the system fall too. So they, they're in, a, in America, what do we say, between a, a stove and a hot spot. <laughs> because that's the system they created. So the system is on trial, the system of commerce, which has, in the Bible, it's called Babylon. So it's actually on trial. And as soon as this really goes and people start to understand it, it's going to be falling because they have to follow their own rules. And if they do not follow their own rules, then they let their system fall. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So it is a contract. It's a completion of a contract which was started by the industry, the corporate industry, because that's how they are functioning. So that is why we could never really understand before, why does Monsanto able to rule the government? You know, they make all the laws about agriculture. Why do these companies always allowed to pollute our water and our lives? Why are they allowed? Because it's just business. And they function within a law system, which we have not been aware of. But in what way have we agreed to become a, like, have this contract with the state? Because they changed out our live birth certificate for uh, here in Denmark. It's for the Baptist, uh, the baptism. What do you call it? Protestant or no? Or in Denmark, they take oh, the yeah, live birth. Yeah certificate and then they give you a fish uh, uh, no what's it called the tau shine you you get your your certificate of baptism birth certificate it's a birth certificate so the it's not the live birth certificate that gets changed in for another certificate which has put you in into the trust account and created you as a number a number in a corporation and what Bibi Bakus has been speaking about and many other people is that there's huge amounts of money being put on these But accounts. should we try and dissolve or annul this contract? And in what way can that be done? Well, that's where you were speaking about declaring yourself to be living and so on. I think this is a very difficult thing. And in power movement is not at, at recommending this or doing anything about that. They're doing it in a different way. If you go direct and try to get your account dissolved or try to get your money, I haven't dived into this, but I know it's not for everybody. It's very complicated. Your life changes. You have to accept a lot of, you You had Ingun here and you know how difficult her life became. Yeah. So it's not what in power is about. In power is for everybody who wants to try and do a few steps with a document. You also become quite empowered because when you understand that everything is an offer and everything is a contract, your life changes suddenly. Mm. You don't, you're not, you are a different person. And when you have conflicts with authorities or shops or this and that, you know how to speak within their own language. So it's actually, it's not an aggressive movement. It's a movement of complete truthfulness and love and grace. And one addresses the people who are initiating this because it's always in the end people that have to do it. They've said yes to be the front man. And these front men are being, going to be addressed more and more around the world with their responsibility. They have responsibility of care. And this is 
if we say natural, this is the high, a high level. You have a res we have responsibility for each other. We cannot unleash horrible technologies into the world. They're going well, to they're doing all of that at the moment because of this COVID-19 pandemic and the global mm -hmm. lockdown and all of this. And now they're and the face masks and restrictions, freedom of speech, enormously challenged and censorship and shadow banning on the internet, speaking about alternative things. Uh, and now, of course, what they talk about, mandatory vaccinations. Bill Gates has been in the You're mainstream talking news it. talking about that nothing will get back to normal until we get these mm -hmm. mandatory forced vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So how can we apply this notice of liability and the, what the In Power movement is doing in terms of what's actually going on, if this is a new world order takeover that they've been talking about for so many years? Well, in order to do the things they want to do, they are going to need a lot of people to Im implement it. And up until now, it's been easier and easier to get the government officials to implement things that are nefarious and dangerous and actually completely against the constitutions, the rules, the everything. They even change the constitutions overnight Why not? in different countries. Why huh? not? Yeah. And people comply to this. They believe it. They are full of fear. They're captured by fear mm. because the mainstream media is telling them and the health officials and all of this. And of course, the politicians. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot of things going on, but it's not covered in the media or you're, it's covered by the alternative medias. And so do you think that this whole um, coronavirus pandemic is part of this, of course, the New World Order, UN Agenda 21, climate change, depopulation plan, ultimately linked to an AI, artificial intelligence agenda with this 5G network and Wi-Fi, smart meters, smart cities, Internet of Things, all of this connecting us through this electromagnetic grid even around the world, and the satellites, the, the, the Elon Musk satellites around the globe. What do you think? Is this part of wanting to connect the human mind with AI eventually? Or maybe already has been done. <laughs> I mean, you had the interviews with Cyrus Parsos, is that his name? Yes. Cyrus A. Parsa? Yes. Yeah, Parsa, yeah. yes. So, mm -hmm. I mean, his, what he's saying is that this is very, very advanced and it could really be that they, I'm sure this is what is being attempted um, to create a kind of a race of automatic people that um, do not think on their own, do not act on their own and taking away this chance from us. So we have to see it's a it's an chance we have and it's going to win, you know. But how much destruction can they do before they finally come to the end? But what can we do right now, hands on? Mm. Well, my opinion about that is really think it through. So anything that they're doing, they've planned it a long time. We know that. So it's, it's 100, 200, or many hundreds of year plans. So there's a plan being going on, and each round, each generation, one can generate the next level of these, this agenda, if we call it that. So there's this uh, Danish philosopher, sociologist. His name was Hollenberg, Johannes Hollenberg. He said, even back then, he died in the 60s, so maybe he said it in the 30s, 40s, that you know, the kind of control that the government now has on our lives, nobody could have envisioned 100 or 200 years ago. They really control your whole life. And now in the Western world, we know that our life is controlled. They control the conception. They control the preconception. They control the birth. They control, the, you know, the vaccines. They control your health. They, there's no sphere of life that is not under control. By thinking that you have your own individual rights because you're not under so-called direct slavery, huh? Yeah, by or, or a direct, exactly. well, dictatorship. And that's the nice trick of it, that you do it in a way that people want it. So this is war on consciousness. This is mind control techniques, basically controlling human perception. Mm -hmm. And people are under this magic spell and they need to 
break that to wake up. We always talk about, say, wake up, wake up. Mm-hmm. That really is what it is in a way, isn't it? To try and, and decalcify that pineal gland and to... Yeah, well, everything's been done that they could chemically through the schools, through the materialism, and through the thoughts, you, you calcify this thing. If you have thoughts that aren't connected to, to other thoughts in such a way that it, it is a spiritual re- the reality that you're getting to with your thoughts, then you're, you will have calcification of your own organs. So decalcification is also thinking things. So in being able to think how the society could look in a different way is already a big step being able to look through it and also realize that at the minute not only did they fuse you know commercial law and the law of the ju- the judicial law of how the people should be behaving with each other or how you know can you kill somebody can you steal all this kind of common law civil law but merging that together it made it very confused yeah so this was this idea which Rudersteiner presented that Actually, these three spe- there are three spheres, main spheres within the social life, and we don't know about it, but they're there, and they have all their separate jurisdictions and ways of, of working. They should be separate from each other, and that is the cultural sphere, that is the economic sphere, and that is the sphere of the judicial. And that if you mix them all together, which traditionally has been done because one wants this mega state, conglomerate state, the Romans did as well, and it's just continued, then people do not know where they are. Are we in the cultural life? So he made people aware of the fact, actually, the French Revolution had those three words, you know, freedom, equality, and brotherhood. And we all learned this in school, and already in school, when I was in the seventh grade, freedom, how does it work with equality? It's two different things, you know? You realize it right away. It doesn't fit in your brain somehow. Brotherhood and freedom, are those, those are sort of wildly different, you know? But that was their, their words that they used to promote this revolution. He says, actually, these are spiritual realities. They got it as a spiritual inspiration, but they didn't know what to do with it. So in the end, they were just cutting off heads on the street. You know, this isn't where it needs to go, but to understand that these, these are three words that belong to three different spheres. So if we're talking about cultural life, what is the main word that we have to promote? That is the freedom of the individual in his cultural development. How does he develop in, in respect to what's calling me inside? Am I an artist? Am I a doctor? Am I this? Am I that? And do I have these branches I need to study to, to fill up this individual? The person needs the freedom. If we do not give this freedom as much as we can to every individual in this world, we don't know what we're missing. We don't know what we're missing because we let children die of hunger somewhere. It's not just the horrible fact that they die of hunger or that they're being misused with pedophiles and all this. It's what are we missing in the world? What could we be getting if everybody was really freed up within the cultural sphere? But then as soon as you go into this other sphere, and we have to realize it's like putting on another costume or hat of the economy. If we just let freedom there, we have what we have today. You know, they always told us the best thing is the free market. You know, this is, this is this interesting for them who have a lot of money. But that the economic sphere is a different sphere. It's we're there to take care of each other. And that's why we, dis, that's why we agreed to specialize. So in the old days when we were self-sufficient, almost everybody was some kind of self-sufficient person. And only the kings and, you know, the higher up. Um, levels they were not self-sufficient but everyone was sort of self-sufficient they did everything we were happy doing everything Um, and we were also a diversified person and now you can't even buy your own piece of land and grow your own food and vegetables huh right they're taking that aspect from us but the fact that we did specialize means we do things for each other so look around here this nice place is there anything you made or in your closet, is there anything I made? Or in my apartment, is my house, is there anything I did? Nothing. My goodness, how many thousands of people are helping me in my life every day, you know? We offer ourselves, we sacrifice for each other. And then we gain a possibility of a new cultural life because we're not so busy making shoes and candles in the night and soap because my soap ran out. Imagine we were doing these things. 
we free ourselves up, we free each other up. But therefore, we have to take care of each other because we've all sacrificed our universal person for something very specialized. And some people work like robots in the factories. And, you know, so we've sacrificed. People our, work very, very hard for small money. For you know. small money. And why should they do that? because they've sacrificed themselves entirely for an industrial process? Why shouldn't they have as much of this pie, which is called the gross national product, as somebody else? We have to divide it. We have to take care of each other. Therefore, this word brotherhood is in the economic sphere. That is the word, not free market, not trickle down economics, not anything else. It is brotherhood. So when we walk into this economic sphere, we put on this, these glasses and we see everything from this way. We go into the judicial. I don't want any laws made that are only for me or only for the ruling classes. We want laws that are helping everybody because we know where it's going that we need to help the individual to their own th th thriving, to their own flourishing, to their own opening of their new qualities. So we know everything has to feed in the end the cultural life, but also the laws have to be made so that the individual can flourish, but also that the economy doesn't kill the world because it has all the tools of destruction in its hands. So what would you suggest that people should do? How should, it, how should we reform things or what would be the best solution right now? This is a difficult moment in time. I think the main thing is to really start to understand it and think it through. Because one, as long as it's in this unified state, unified government, where all these different spheres are in one, and they can decide over what medicine you get, they can decide over this, one cannot see what's going on. Can you say no to these things well, when you are under this so-called uh, contract, with, uh, under the state, huh? Well, this is the thing England was speaking to you about, that one feels always from the beginning, well, we are actually paying for the wars, we're doing this, we're part of it. And that is what they want. They, want, they create this matrix and we're all part of it. But in the end, the individual has the individual power. And this is what in power pe is showing people, that in you is the power. It's not there. They're creating this, this smoke and gun, smoke and mirrors aspect as well, so that we are frightened, that we are paralyzed, that we are... But they even say that if you don't get this, they even suggest that perhaps it will be this way, that if you don't take or get the, vac the, the vaccination and the vaccine, mm -hmm. then you can't travel, mm -hmm. then you can't even go to work or certain jobs will not have you there any longer, and there are places you can't go. Mm -hmm or be part of. Okay, well, one thing one can do right now is really work with this in power movement because it's going to stop it. You know, once it rolls out, imagine that here in Denmark, I don't want to name names, but somebody who is in the, uh, the Ministry of Health is getting 500 letters on his desk saying that he is responsible. And these letters aren't just nice letters. They are nice, they're very kind, but they are in commerce. So in commerce, you charge people. Commerce is all about money. So you, cre you cre create the case, not in court. So how much w would you charge that health minister here? Per day for not stopping 5G. So you have seven days to start taking it down. You have seven days to come and take out my smart meter. And if you haven't done it, then we will start charging you. How much? Well, they're recommending $10,000 a day. It's a very nice sum, but it, it will accumulate quickly unless they take it down. Once they take it down, then we're fine with it. But then so, so they will be create, we are creating, we will be creating letters of debt. So they will be owing huge amounts of money. And this will be part of the public record because it will all be online. So the notice of letters. liability can really be implemented, uh, applied and used by people. It can be and you and will, used. and you are structuring this with all of the people that you work with in the in power movement and this is all over the world basically of course we go to many different countries mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. so this so so people can find their own division of the in power movement yes. in several countries at least yes 16 countries 
so there 16, 16 countries, countries around the world for now right so and, and then we're still i mean some countries haven't started or switzerland has maybe started germany hasn't got there it's going so but sweden norway and denmark already have got got the work going denmark is finished with our nol it's ready to be released soon and then people can start using the documents and i think it will be extremely powerful you know if if so so I this is the importance of working together huh exactly and really working on one project that's knowing i know it's going to work you know imagine you are minister of health you get these letters it's there on internet wow he got 20 letters today wow he got 30 letters tomorrow he's getting all these letters and then the ledger is going to be there he owes so much money to this person he's now owing this to them he's going to have a nice amount of pressure on his poor shoulders the poor man but he is responsible he has a duty of care to us he has a duty of care yeah, but can he be forced to pay all of his money to people We'll see how it's going to go. But for his life, it's not very comfortable, right? So you have to think of the whole connections, like with the glass. Well, what would happen to you? Oh, I would want to quit my job, right? Try to get away. Thank you very much. Okay, I go to another company. Some of them are already moving. We've seen them move. Rossman's already gone. So some of these people are, are all around the world. They're moving. So they move to another place. But thank you very much. We're good researchers. We're going to send it to your new workplace. And we're going to send the next person who comes and sits in your workplace workplace also a document and remind him that this document belongs in your workplace so he will also get one so if he moves to another place the document becomes two and the the debt is growing so there's many things that we know about debt what is a bank it's all debt so a paper saying that he owes me after so many weeks and months maybe so many hundreds of thousands is already money in our today's system, which they created. So is there actually a website where people can read more about this and really go in depth and understand the whole thing? It's and, called and empowermovement.com and you can become a member and have access to the so-called interim site, which is the transitional site until the final one is open. And on that site, there are literally hundreds of hours of reading and and documents and not the doc not the nol it's not available at the moment but there's the understanding as well as videos and webinars there's regular webinars going on i think we had what was it last night or two nights ago there was a webinar for all the members and these regular webinars are going on where people can talk together understand the system and be of the of the nol and be ready to start to send it and get involved and get so involved it's in we need power movement so it's in power mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. so just briefly in our remaining moment here your final most positive thoughts <laughs> for people listening to this i have tons of positive thoughts i just think it's an amazing time to be alive we are all asked to do that work, to go inside. And you see, I, I'm amazed at how many people I see talking who are saying, I've, I've, it's in here, you know. People are feeling this being in me, which they've been trying to tell me is some arbitrary thing which happened in some way. Or I took botany 101 and what did we learn after three weeks of interesting plant life and plant development? We had to learn that there was some mud and then the lightning came there, and then a cell came about. Scratch your head again. A cell came out of lightning and mud? It doesn't make sense. So everything is arbitrary. So this cell was born with organs, it had a membrane, it had DNA, it had this, and just lightning came and there it was. Can you repeat this experiment? Well, no, but this is what we base our science on. So there we have this science of the abstract hypothesis. So today, and that goes over to you To you are just an arbitrary thing that came about through chance, through mutation. Then we had to learn all the mutation steps. So it was a one cell organism, then there was a mutation, became a two cell organism. And then all these mutations happened. And then one day there you were, Lucas Alexander, <laughs> through mutation and chance. And, you know, it sounds very ridiculous, doesn't it? But today people are noticing it is a myth. It's worse than the myths that they told us were myths. It's actually a lie. We are something completely different. 
an individual in this world in this world right now and is so important every one of us is so important and we are really able to show to get the glasses on this show through the smoke and mirrors and see begin to see the reality and then we will know what to do my words for everyone are start to think about it start to know how things should look like in the economy in the social life start to make the plan write a new constitution just wake up tomorrow and say what should i write and you'll start to have ideas the ideas are there they're just streaming at us all the time we have to grab them develop them implement it bring it to manifestation that's my last word <laughs> wow wow it's been really fascinating really interesting and wonderful to have this in-depth conversation with you and i want thank to thank you, you so much trust. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane Vincent, for doing this interview with Age of Truth TV. And thank you, Lucas. It was very nice. <laughs> thank you very much to Diane Vincent, and thanks to all of you for watching Age of Truth TV. You can support us by clicking onto our website, ageoftruth.tv. And please like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. Your support is greatly appreciated. On behalf of the Age of Truth TV team, we thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> that was good.